Okay. Case. Fittings. Lots of time passed between the original plan that I made and now sitting here with all of the actual fittings that I want to use. Before I go ahead and actually put them in for the last time, cut my tubing, seal everything up, try and go for this, um, I'm gonna go uh, highlight for all of you the process that I went through and run down all of the fittings that I used for this build because when I was going through and uh, looking online and doing my research and trying to preempt all of the trouble that I may or may not have had, uh, I was unable to find any specifics on the exact um, fittings and everything that would go well with this distribution plate, this case, this hardware, etc. I will include uh, information on all of the particular things that I have used here um, in the comments as well. But for posterity, if you don't recognize it, Leon Lee uh, 011D XL case um, with the uh, it's pretty standard at this point, I think, EKWB reflection uh, distribution plate in the front. That is the one that's specifically and only made for the XL version of this case. Um, let's go ahead and dive in. Eve, stop it. <sighs> Helping me today, Eve. So I'm going to be talking about the bottom radiator with these, piece, these few pieces. So the fittings that I used related to that one and getting attached to the distro plate were six 90 degree rotary adapters, four hard tube compression fittings, two seven millimeter extenders from EK, and two 10 millimeter extenders from Barrow. These are the only scenario where the components are not all from EK. If you're curious, this is what the various packaging currently looks like. There we go, four of these. You'll see that these are not the same size in overall diameter, but they are the same size for the inside tube, and that's what counts. Also, they happen to make a nice smiley face. So one of the main reasons that I wanted to actually make this video, in addition to showing off the exact fittings that I was able to use to make this work, was to talk about the, the setup of this general bottom part. <laughs> uh, because in addition to um, getting the runs perfect and the spacing correct for this bottom radiator plus fans into the distribution plate, one of the things that you may have noticed um, if you were looking at online examples of this, more often than not, as far as I could see in their in their builds, they would get this first run perfect. It would be great, but then this back run would be a freaking nightmare. Uh, and it was mostly because, uh, as far as I could tell, they were doing vertical GPU mounts in such an orientation or with a particular mount such that there wasn't enough space to get this thing to come up and just go straight into the distribution plates. Um, and it was not entirely clear to me what I would have to do to actually make that possible. Uh, and as far as I can tell, the number one thing you have to be willing to do to make this possible, to have a nice run back there, is to not worry too much about the height of your uh, GPU mount and how it might overlap with the other components on your motherboard. Um, because if I had wanted to mount this thing such that there wasn't even the tiniest bit of obstruction on my CPU water block or on the bottom five millimeters of my light up memory or something like that, I would have had to put this in the lower orientation and I would have had no shot at getting, getting that lower run to be 
um, nice and straight and not have to do something strange with additional fittings or go around a corner or do some other different height from the other thing. Uh, and that was more important to me than not overlapping the tiniest bit with the bottom of the memory here, as you can see. Um, my personal opinion is that, yes, it's a little bit of overlapping, but I'd rather get the bottom um, nice and uh, basically the same uh, on both sides. Um, and the other thing I think that has to do with this decision is what GPU mount you use. Um, I could have gone with the Leon Lee um, specific provided mount that goes with this case. You can find it if you go um, look online for the O11D XL vertical mount. Um, I really never seriously considered that one because if you look at it, it's gigantic. Uh, it goes out a huge amount. It goes out probably to like here, something like that. And they really don't, they don't really care about the aesthetics of it as far as I can tell because they intend for you to put that card pretty far into it and there's just a whole bunch of open, unused space right here. And the whole point of the GPU, vertical GPU mount is to look amazing. And I, I want to make it as clean as possible. Um, basically, in the end, I, I didn't even consider that one. Um, there are some videos online, plenty of other options for mounts. In the end, I went with the EKWB one. Um, that's pretty common in this build. If you've been paying attention, most of my parts are from EK. Um, they make a mount that is specifically um, for vertically mounting these uh, GPU blocks. And since they make the GPU blocks, you can be pretty confident that you're getting something that is gonna be sturdy enough for it. They provide a couple different orientations for high and low options. Um, I put everything uh, in the high option for the particular mount and I have chosen to mount it. I believe you can see here in the middle of my available slots on the back of the case, there is one remaining um, cover on the bottom and one remaining cover on the top. I put it right in the middle. Um, if you're looking for how, how I set mine up to be able to um, replicate that. The other thing to call out about this particular mount is that you don't have to worry about uh, sag or anything. In addition to being uh, quite uh, sturdy in and of itself, if you can see back here, this screw um, connects into uh, a piece of the metal mount that is attached to um, both the mount and then another screw that also goes into that motherboard header. Um, sorry, not header, motherboard, standoff underneath the motherboard. Um, and the way you install that is basically uninstall those two motherboard screws that came, um, that you used originally and put these big long screws and their special uh, standoffs on instead. So this thing is, I am extremely happy with it. It's like a rock, it's on there, it's perfect. It's very clean, it's very smooth. There's plenty of room on the bottom here um, for my runs to get across. And just for the record as well, since it wasn't clear to me from other um, other videos of this. Uh, the way this is set up in the O11DXL case, this thing down here, technically speaking, see these little these little latches here and here? Um, if I didn't have a radiator and a fan and everything, there are two screws on here that you can pull off and you can take this thing out. Um, in the case uh, instruction manual, they call it, I believe, a maybe a hard drive mount hard drive and SSD mount, something like that. And I, I wasn't sure when I got this case if the expectation was that the radiator would screw directly into that or not. What I found was it is intended that you leave that on when you screw the radiator on. There are holes specifically for it. Maybe you could find a way to attach your radiator without it there if you wanna gain the maybe centimeters worth of height um, that you would get from that. But I, I don't know if you'd have to get creative with the screw holes or you'd have to mod it or, or something like that. Um, I found that it's intended to be left on there. Um, and then the radiator itself is an EK Coolstream uh, Classic SE360, um, which is pretty pretty specific. That is one that I had found other people use online because it is so slim. Uh, I believe it was 27 millimeters. Don't necessarily quote me on that one height-wise. Um, and that plus the fans, as you can see in my build, left, we, left me with enough room to get those runs the way I want it to be. Um, and just for posterity here, I will also give you a, a quick look at um, what this actually looks like on the side here. Um, this radiator comes with uh, a little bit of a, you know, uh, extra height on top of the piece that gets screwed in. So if you are looking at measuring things very precisely there for the millimeters um, that you're going to have available above the um, 
above the fans on the radiator and to plug into the distrib distribution plate. Um, I do suggest that you look at the manual for these radiators. They all have, um, either in the manual or in the images on the website, they have a nice specification usually um, where they'll show you the height of the overall radiator, but they often also show you the height to the very top of that um, area where you're screwing in your water cooling fitting. Um, so it's entirely possible that you're not going to want to get that precise with it. I know I didn't really, even though I am willing to be extremely neurotic with my research. I did get to the point where I purchased basically 95% of my fittings um, and parts and everything, and I was going to figure out the, the final 5% after I can have it in front of me, use a, a tape measure and actually look at what I've got. And so that is the part that I did, and I'm making this video effectively to uh, hopefully set you all up with the ability to not have to do that if you do want to try and take what I've got here um, and uh, run with that. All right, these are the fittings that we're gonna use for connecting the top radiator to the distribution plate. As with all of these, we've got the standard four hard tubing compression fittings to attach our tubing. Yes, hi Eve. Uh, we also have, on, for on the left-hand side that you'll see in a moment here, um, two 14 millimeter extenders that connect onto two 90 degree rotaries so that we're able to get down past the fans and make that turn towards the distribution plate. And then on the distribution plate side, because there is a very slight vertical difference um, that results from using these other fittings, these are three millimeter offsets from EK. I will say that one note on these offsets, they are rotary, but they don't look like they're rotary. Um, so if you can see here, there's no visible line here like you get on this kind of fitting where this is very obvious. This is where it's able to turn. So once once you've actually got this guy screwed into your thread, you're still able to make these turn if you need to. Um, and I was a little bit worried that that wasn't the case with these, but EK's actually got a really clever little fitting on the inside here. Um, basically, the thread itself is able to twist if you need it to. So it's probably a little bit hard to see, but see how I'm twisting it here? I'm able to hold that thread and everything else twists. Um, so if you do need it to actually twist and things don't line up perfectly, you can do that. So don't freak out like I did when I initially got this. It is a rotary fitting. All right, these are our fittings that we're gonna to use to connect the CPU monoblock to the distribution plate. Again, as always, we've got our four hard tube and compression fittings. Um, we have, in this case, four 90 degree rotary fittings. This is the very common theme in this build. And then the two kind of oddballs that you'll see how they go in in a moment here. Um, we have here a seven millimeter EK extender, and then here a seven millimeter EK offset. Um, both seven millimeters, but clearly totally different things. Okay, so here's the deal with the CPU monoblock. Um, if I didn't say it earlier, this is not the normal velocity or magnitude block from EKWB. This is the Monoblock specifically made for the Crosshair 8 Hero motherboard that covers additional pieces of the motherboard, cools um, more than just the CPU. We can look that up if you want. Uh, I got it mostly because it looks cool and it didn't cost that much more than the regular CPU block. Uh, I don't really expect that the heat difference on those other components is going to make a huge difference, but who knows. Um, basically, one thing I learned, though, is that on certain components, uh, as part of the custom loop, um, the inlet and outlet do matter, and some of them don't matter. So like on the GPU, technically there is an inlet and an outlet, but if you look at EKWB's website, 
Um, they say that they really don't think it matters which one you put the water in first, um, and therefore it doesn't particularly matter to me if it doesn't matter to them. But with the CPU monoblock, they do want the water to be going on top of the CPU first. And in this case, that is this on the, on the, the right-hand side. That's the inlet. They say that you will absolutely have decreased performance if you don't respect that being the inlet. Now, the thing about that is that on the distribution plate, there is also a very specific inlet and outlet. And it just so happens that the inlet is on the outside. So if you think about what the perfect kind of loop would be in the ideal scenario here, it would be super clean. Everything would line up completely horizontally. This guy would come out of here, loop in, and go to the inner one. And then this guy would come out at the exact same level and loop to the outer one. And you have nice clean lines. And if you look online for other people that have used this distribution plate, some of them have done that. Um, and I believe it might be possible with the non-monoblock solution. But with this solution, you have to cross them over or you are disobeying EK's rules. Um, and so as a result, I've gotten a little bit creative here. You can see other people's solutions too. But basically, you need to cross them over each other, the tubes. Um, and in addition to that, I found that they're not exactly lined up vertically either. Um, so I have taken some measurements, and this is my dealing with that. <laughs> so on the outer side over here, which needs to come out, cross over the, the, the right-hand side there and attach to the inner left-hand most uh, piece of the distrib distribution plate. I have used uh, two 90-degree rotary adapters on each side in order to offset um, vertically enough to kind of get out of the way of the other run. Um, but you'll also notice that Right here, between this 90 degree and this 90 degree fitting, I've added an EK seven millimeter offset. Um, I found that in my measurements, that was going to be the closest offset uh, extender. Sorry, not an offset, an extender. I found that that's going to be the closest um, difference in height to get me uh, in line with these. And I just measured it out and it looks like it's gonna be pretty good. So the run I'm gonna have to make is just going to be straight out from here, one 90 degree turn and into that one. That's the goal. Um, and then the other side of things here, what I've got plugged into this one is a seven millimeter offset, not an extender. It is offsetting vertically down in the case from where it was uh, because that did not line up with this hole perfectly. On this side, there's no fitting. This is just the, um, uh, the thing that the tube goes directly into. There's no additional 90s or extenders or anything over there. So the plan is for it to just come straight out of this seven millimeter offset, make a right angle turn, and then go straight into that. And we should get two nice parallel uh, runs as a result. They won't be perfectly in line with each other like the GPU, but they should be nice. Um, they'll be maybe an inch apart and, and show off a bit more of the, um, the water cooling. I will say, though, that I had a hell of a time measuring these things to try and make sure that they actually are going to work out. Um, especially since when you're measuring vertically up onto the top of the case and the distance from the outlet or the inlet of one of these things to the top of the case, which is what I did, um, you have to deal with the fact that if you measure while the fans are in there, there's not really great places to rest a ruler. Um, that resulted in my getting kind of creative with a few different solutions for how to, um, how to measure things. I'm not proud of all of my techniques. Yeah. Uh, in the end, though, basically all I did was pick a common place on the top or the bottom of the case that I can rest a measure or a tape measure on and then just measure to some part on one of the fittings that I would be able to um, measure to the same part. So maybe you could measure to the very top of the fitting that the tube goes in, or you could measure to the very top of your 90 degree adapter or something that's going to be the same in uh, different places. What do you think, Eve? Hi. All right, these are the fittings that we're using to connect the GPU water block to the distro plate. We've got our four 
hard tube and compression fittings. We've got, in this case, two 90 degree rotary fittings. Uh, and then the odd ones out are one 28 millimeter EK extender. Um, this is to get that far side um, uh, inlet outlet far enough out so that we can make the corner with the 90 degree and not have the runs run into each other. And then for connecting to the distribution plate, we've got two EK offsets. In this case, these are for the 14 millimeter offsets. Um, it's the largest one that they make. Okay, see this? This one moves fine, but this one, that's trouble. Yeah, see, trouble. So I'm going to attempt to put you straight on here so you can see what I'm talking about. In measuring these things out, they're pretty much spot on, maybe a millimeter or two off, but pretty much spot on in the vertical at this point. And that's pretty good, but let me show you the horizontal. Well, this is the best I got. I don't know if you can see this exactly, but the summary is those are not really lined up. It's close, but we were going for millimeter precision and we got centimeter precision. So I'm thinking that because I don't really have any idea of other offsets or fittings that I'd be able to do, I'm guessing we're just going to slightly bend the pipe to the side. I'll have to check when I actually get the full length tube in there. Um, Eve, maybe, maybe don't get the cat hair on the computer. Thanks. Um, but that one is going to be much easier than the inside one. Okay, so I'm taking a quick break. Um, I've done half of my tube runs uh, at this point. Started with the easiest ones. Um, that would be the totally straight uh, bottom radiator and totally straight top radiator. So that's uh, a pair of tubes on each, four tubes total. Um, I actually bought a total of 10 tubes. They're acrylic, just for the record, acrylic card tubing. Um, to do this build, even though I technically only need eight because I assumed that I might screw some of them up. Um, more on that in a second. But basically I've done half of them at this point and I wanted to give you a rundown on how that's gone as well as what tools I use. So um, if you look online for some kind of do-it-yourself kits on the hard tube 
um, uh, bending and cutting and whatnot, uh, you're going to find a couple things. There are kits that they sell. Um, I haven't done actually done the bending yet. My that bending stuff is over there. But kit comes with a saw. Um, I also bought myself a chamfer uh, tool like this, which is for um, one side does the inside of the tube and the other side does the outside of the tube. Um, and basically you want to try and get a nice smooth kind of angled end on that tube so when you're stuffing it into the O-ring on the compression fitting, it doesn't break it. Um, so I have this tool. I additionally have some sandpaper so then I'm able to use uh, that once the uh, chamfering is done to get a nice kind of smooth finish on the end of the tube. This is 1500 grit. I just picked some up off of Amazon. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show is this thing's a little bit extravagant. I think it was 20 or 30 bucks not the drill, the particular drill bit um, that is supposed to do the same thing as this tool without all the fancy hand movements and wearing yourself out if you're doing heat tubes. Um, a little bit more on this thing later maybe. Uh, I would say that while useful to shorten the length of the tube quickly, uh, it's not as perfect as I would want it to be. I've found that I use these things together. I get it to the right length with this, finish it off with this guy, and then the sandpaper. So uh, on that point though, I did want to make one um, point on that drill bit. As I said, I cut things a bit long, then use that to, to quickly get it down to the right length, but I was a little bit overzealous. These are my four well done tubes. In order to get to that point, here's my four messed up tubes. Uh, I went one and one on the, uh, the good and the messed up, unfortunately, it's pretty embarrassing. But I wanted to tell you uh, how I messed them up because these tubes are perfectly fine as far as the end goes. They're nice and even, they're nice and rounded and sanded, etc. They're all too short for what I was using them for. Uh, and they're not too short by a lot. They're too short by like two millimeters, three millimeters. Uh, and that's because I was impatient. I took off too much with the drill. Uh, and as a result, the tube was then no longer useful for what I was doing. Now, that being said, they're not scrap. Um, I would recommend you do your longest, easiest run first so that if something does go wrong like this, you can reuse these things later. Um, despite the fact that they're not useful for these long straight runs, they are still going to be useful for my GPU run or my CPU run. Um, so hopefully I'm still good and I told you I bought two extra tubes also, so I've still got two uncut tubes over there. Um, wish me luck on the rest of the build. I think that uh, I will be... Uh, starting with these tubes uh, and seeing if I have uh, any skill with them then. Um, that's up next. But before I do, um, one quick note also on getting the fitting and the length of these things right. There's not really any guide as far as I can tell or instructions on how long they're supposed to be or how exactly they fit into the, the compression fittings. Um, if you haven't seen the compression fittings before, you can look on EK's website or whoever's website. But basically, um, they split up into two parts um, when you unscrew the one part. So you unscrew uh, the one end and you end up with this piece here with one O-ring and one kind of screw top. And then this piece here with the O-ring and the uh, you know one quarter screw that normally goes into fitting. And then on the other side, this longer screw um, that that screws onto as well as a compression fitting on the inside. And the point that I want to make is basically as you can see here with these, this part will be the part that is actually sticking out that you need to put your tube into. Um, and I have been lining it up with the roughly the O-ring that's on the inside of this tube, uh, or sorry, the inside of this fitting, because my understanding is that the way this works, let me show you, the way this works is you put your screw on onto your tube and you put the O-ring like that, um, and then when this thing is screwed into where you want it to go, then you place this in basically, you know, as close as you can, and then push these together and screw it on. Um, it's not the easiest to do in front of you all without it being locked into something. Here, I'll just screw this end. But basically these then screw into each other. Um, and there's nothing like holding this thing in strongly. It's just kind of compressed, hence compression fitting. Um, onto the fitting itself, and there's two O-rings, both the one that was inside that screw and the one that I had kind of rolled on here a moment ago. Um, and I think that as long as your tube is hitting both of those compression fittings and you're getting a good seal that way, then you, you should be good. So there's gonna be a little bit of wiggle room as far as how, um, how long your tube should actually be to make this work. 
That being said, uh, I have not completed my loop and tested my current theory, but I believe that that's the way it works. And so I'm just trying to get it um, roughly halfway down the big screw, about halfway down this thing, which is where that O-ring is sitting on the inside. So Ronnie from the future chiming in to say that I was not entirely right here. The concept of the dual O-rings working together to compress and cause a seal is true, but you need to get the two past the second O-ring, not just touching it or on it, past it. Uh, for me, this required quite a lot of force, uh, far more than I had been comfortable using previously, and that's why I didn't discover this earlier. Um, there is a good 5 to 10 millimeters more space, so you should be able to tell when it moves and you've got it right. You can also look in the opposite side of the fitting and see the difference. Why this isn't made clear by EK is beyond me, but I had to get a whole extra set of tubing and cut everything again to correct this, as for the second time, almost all my tubes were too short. Uh, and I'm going to finish up uh, with these guys and I think move on to trying to bend a few tubes and we will see what happens. All right, so before we try this, I'm going to explain what I'm trying to do. So I have my tube. Uh, I'm trying, taking my own advice from the earlier easier sections and doing the longest tube first in case I screw it up. Um, and basically this tube is 50 centimeters long and this is a long run so I need at least 30 centimeters on one side and to again to be safe and then maybe at least 10 centimeters on the other side so I'm trying to get the the bend to be in the roughly 30 to 40 centimeter 10 centimeter gap uh, and my intention here is going to be trying to use the right angle on this box um, to measure it. I only have two bends to make. I didn't feel like it was worth buying a jig um, or buying a, a bending kit. I mean, this will get me a right angle. The question is, am I going to be able to make the length of the turn, if that makes sense, the same on both tubes? Um, I will, if this goes well, leave the completed one next to it so I can compare the second one as I'm doing it, make sure they get um, basically the same. Uh, so the plan here is going to be use this soapy water on the plastic insert, insert the plastic insert into the tube here at this end, heat the tube on this guy, and then as I said, bend on here. Um, I have marked very, very lightly on here with some regular old number two pencil, um, roughly the ends of those that 10 centimeter area that I was looking for. Um, the internet and my own messing around makes me think that I should be able to get that off pretty easily after the bend is done. If I end up accidentally heating things to the point where it's stuck in there forever, I can barely see it anyway, so it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, that would also be on the part of the bend where it would be very difficult to see. So, all right, without further ado, uh, let's try this and see what happens. Also, safety first, but to get the uh, plastic insert thing in here, I think I'm going to try and not use my gloves.
All right, so for you, it's been a split second. For me, it's been a few weeks. Um, yes, there was Thanksgiving in the middle, but the primary reason was that uh, I had to order a couple extra parts because I screwed some stuff up. So I had said before that I had to redo pretty much all of my tubing uh, because I didn't realize how far you had to push it into the fittings. Um, when I attempted to then do my tubing a second time and used my leak tester, which is what's going on right now, by the way, it's my last leak test, hopefully last leak test, um, I was hearing a hissing, I was getting temp uh, pressure leaking out of the, the leak tester, it just wasn't working correctly, and I, I ended up having to take apart different parts of it, I did it, oh God, too many times, a few times at least, um, trying to figure out what was wrong with it, and in the end, I decided that uh, one of the O-rings, the inner O-rings on one of the fittings down here needed to be replaced. Um, and that was pretty much the, the end of the line for that because it was going to be another week to get um, these guys. Little extra O-rings from EKWB uh, shipped over from Slovenia. Um, and so I took a break, um, I got these, and I was ready to, to go again. I replaced the O-ring I thought needed replacing, I put everything back together, and there was basically no change. I was not happy. I was not happy. Um, so what I figured out um, in the end, I took another day or two. I just kind of chilled out, um, and then I, I took apart the entire bottom radiator section of tubes because I had been hearing the hissing down here. And I assumed that it was something to do with one of these tube lengths or one of these sets of fittings because that's where I was hearing the hissing noise. So I took them apart. I tried to see if the length was off. It seemed to be good enough to me. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. You have a few millimeters of wiggle room there. Um, as long as it's past that second O-ring, I think it's, it's fine. Um, I tried to take the leak tester and individually put my thumb over each end of one of these fittings and plug the other end of the leak tester and pump it up and just see if maybe there was something wrong with my fitting. The, nine, the, the rotary piece of it or something. Nope, all four were fine. Um, and then I had an idea, and this is an idea that I wanna pass along to you guys. Um, something that a lot of people say when testing your custom loop is to basically do a leak test on every piece of it individually. I did not think that that was really possible to do with this style of loop because of the distribution plate and the fact that each of the ends of the components go straight into the distribution plate. So I didn't really have an opportunity to, for example, set up the top radiator and then plug in the leak tester because the distribu distribution plate's full of holes. Um, that wasn't, that wasn't going to work. But I do have some extra plugs. Um, in this case, I have three extra plugs. I believe that the reason is that, for one, the leak tester is in one of these spots. Um, for two, I have a temperature sensor down in the bottom right in another one down there, and then the GPU water block comes with uh, um, a couple of uh, plugs as well, although I think those had to be used on the back of it. Whatever, doesn't matter. The point is, I got three extra plugs for my distribution plate, given all the stuff that I bought. Um, which meant that while I did not have the ability to plug up all the holes but two, I did have the ability to plug up just these two bottom ones um, in order to test individual components of the bottom radiator. And so what I ended up doing was I detached the tubes and the fittings down here and just plugged the holes in the distribution plate. Just sanity check. I wanted to see, is the rest of the loop okay? Is there something I'm not understanding? Is it something to do with the, the, the fit, the screw area or whatever you want to call it the inlet outlet on the actual hole on the distribution plate i don't know i wanted to say to check it i removed this bottom part as a even a factor and i just plugged those two holes and i did it again and you know what happened the exact same thing exact same thing hissing same area same temperature uh, uh pressure drop exact same thing so i sat back for a second and i said huh the heck is going on there? And then I figured it out. The hissing was coming from this area, but it was not these two fittings. It was the temperature sensor in the back. Temperature sensor in the back. Uh, and I had screwed that in. It was pretty tight, honestly, and it looked like it was, it was totally screwed in, but I could give it another couple screws. 
and that was the difference. Um, actually, I, I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. I actually totally removed it, put my third plug in there, and then did a leak, uh, leak test, and everything was cool. So I thought maybe there was just something wrong with the temperature sensor. Um, but then when I put it back in, I tried to really, really screw it in, and everything was fine afterwards. Um, so I was kicking myself a little bit. I did not, in the end, have to take this bottom part apart as many times as I did. But whatever. Um, in the end, figured it out, put everything back together, and now we're here um, doing the final leak test. I, I have prep pumped this up to about uh, 0.3 on the uh, little, um, little dial that comes with the EKWB leak tester. Um, that is what is recommended for full loop testing uh, in the manual. Um, this leak tester seems to be used by everybody in the water cooling world, as far as I could tell, in, uh, on YouTube and whatnot. And like some others that have commented on its use on YouTube, do not be fooled by the green and red uh, icons on there. That has nothing to do with how much you should be pumping up your loop to. Do not pump it up into the green or the red just because you see that on there. Read the manual. It says 0.3 um, plus or minus, I think, 0.05. And leave it there for at least 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. Read the manual. Happens to be one of my strengths, but I know not everybody is good at it. I'm guessing, though, if you're willing to sit here and listen to me ramble for however long this video ends up being, that you're going to be the type of person that is willing to read the manual, and given that you're probably dealing with components worth thousands of dollars, it's worth your time. Um, yeah. So, um, part of the reason I'm doing this now is that I'm waiting for this thing to get up, I don't know, I'll probably leave it a half an hour instead of just 15 minutes, because, as far as I can tell, that's it. I think it's time to fill her up. Exciting. Stop rubbing on the camera, please. Eve, oh my god. Oh my god. 